You know, smart house is a term I actually stole from uh, James Sheamus, nice. Focus Fe so you know, head of Focus <laughs> Features, you know, all hail James Sheamus. Uh, you know, they, they, they use this term smart house when I worked at Focus because it, it, term, it was about movies that had an art house sensibility, but they were aimed at the mainstream. So, you know, this wasn't something that you could only catch like on the outskirts of the city, but it had the sort of, you know, artfulness and daring and sincerity of an art house film. And, um, but it had something on its mind. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, the, the sort of awards black movies very typically deal with the tragedy of the black experience. And I felt like there was just a there was just a complete absence of the smart house, just like topical, interesting, engaging, but not necessarily epic slavery or, you know, light and fluffy rom-com, the stuff in the middle, you know, that is aimed somewhat near the mainstream, but dares to talk about things that the mainstream isn't talking about. How come the only black movies Hollywood wants to make are ones with black mammies in fat suits? Yeah. Or black women in pain, man. So basically we got black people dying in the past mm -hmm. and black Black people dying in the press. Can we have a movie with, you know, characters in them instead of stereotypes wrapped in Christian dogma? Why is every educated person inherently evil? Most people are here to see Fang 9. It's got two chains in it. What's up, everybody? This is Lear Respect for Real Black, and I am sitting here with dear white people filmmaker, Justin Simeon. How are you today? I'm very good. Wonderful. So good to be sitting here with you. Wonder it's great to have you here, Philly, <laughs> on this rainy, dreary day. I love it. I love your dreary, because I'm in L.A., so it really yeah. never rains in Southern California. It's like, <laughs> so that's it's, true. It's too much pressure when the sun is out. Like, I need a good cloudy day every once in a while. So I'm, appre I'm appreciating it. I'm, I'm good. I'm good Wonderful. with it. Well, yeah. we're happy to have you here. Thank um, you. You know, I know who you are, but who is is Justin Simeon? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Where did Can you, you tell me? Can you, would you let me know? Would you let me yeah. in on it? Where, where did you get your uh, start? Where are you from? What's a, a little bit of your background? Yeah, so I'm from Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, born and raised there and knew I wanted to be a filmmaker since I was a little kid. I actually like it, it just dawned on me one day. I was like watching car I was like watching X-Men or some, you know, cartoons. I was like, it's somebody's job, I think. I think to put the stuff I like on the TV and in the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. And from that age on, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I went to Forming Visual Arts High School there, you know, HSPVA. And from there, I went to uh, film school at Chapman University, Dodge College of Media Arts. And uh, that was kind of my path, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, it just took me a little while to get here. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I think I heard through the grapevine that you were a publicist. That's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, how did you make that transition? Well, I, um, you know, pub publicity was always something I was kind of good at. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that like my first few stories at least are gonna be kind of niche, little specialty. I better figure out how to like actually get people excited about them. Right. That was just my <laughs> instinct in college. And so I, um, I took an internship at Focus Features and worked in their publicity department. And Adrienne Bowles, who is an amazing woman and was heading up that uh, department, she you know, said, hey, I got an assistant job open. What do you think? And mm -hmm. I started assisting there right out of college uh, for Rogue Pictures. A woman named Pauletta Osorio was my boss. And I was doing studio publicity. And that just kind of became my career. Nice. Yeah, and the transition came because, you know, I would go home and I couldn't sleep at night because <laughs> mm. the, you know, the dream was still there yeah. and would not be deferred easily. Yeah. So I, you know, began to find ways to just sort of feed the demon, feed the beast, you know, and I would write screenplays at night. I would make short films. I would make web series. I would just keep finding a way to turn it out. And eventually, you know, a script that was called 2% when I started it in college, became Dear White People and mm -hmm. made itself very clear that it was time for it to, to you know, make its way into the world. And that's yeah. really what happened. Yeah, I mean, so speaking of Dear White People, uh, just to show a little favoritism, I, I absolutely love the film. Thank I you think so much. It, it was something that I needed to see. Um, and, and really one of the things that have spoken to me more uh, out of the media I've been seeing, mm. out of this generation. So, yeah. Dear White People is the first of this generation, uh, the first narrative feature that really tackles race, mm. like head on, like unabashedly, we are talking about race, <laughs> you know, in a way that I feel like a lot of films um, have shied away from or mm. just touched on. Right. Uh, why this film? What were some of your influences? Why is this the, f the first feature from Justin Simeon and why yeah. did it need to be made? 
Um, you know, for me, it was it kind of came out of the conversations I was having with my friends. You know, I was sitting in a Black Student Union meeting one day, and we were just like kind of just joking and talking. I was like, why are we even friends with some of these people? Like, is it just because we're black? And is that what's going on? And how come he talks like that when he's with that dude? And he talks mm, like that when he's with this code other? switching. Yeah, and we were just having this conversation about code switching and the things that you talk about when you're black and you're in college and <laughs> you go to mostly white school. And, um, and of course, I've always had friends of all races, and we were just always kind of having that conversation and I didn't see it happening anywhere in the culture although every all of my friends we were having that conversation um, and I knew that the only way to really do that as a movie would be to in some way sort of like reach back into the past to, to do the right things in the Hollywood shuffles and those really kind of funny um, artful kind of in your face uh, you know multi protagonist black movies that were totally extinct you know when I was by the time I was in film school so for me it was like both like a it was a throwback but it was a way to sort of introduce a new conversation. Yeah. Uh, and that just gelled in my head one day in 2005, and by 2006 I had a draft of something called 2%, mm -hmm. by this 2% black population on this campus. Yeah. And, um, and that's really how it started. The goal of counterculture is to wake up the mainstream. I have furniture older than you. Counterculture? Is that what you think this is? Your little show? What about my show? The show is racist. <laughs> black people can't be racist. Prejudice, yes, but not racist. Racism describes a system of disadvantage based on race. Black people can't be racist since we don't stand to benefit from such a system. Your antics are making press, Sam. And press like this keeps men like President Fletcher up at night. Warm milk? He's building a file on you. OK, it's not my fault that your son couldn't beat me in an election. It's a very bold choice to make this your first feature narrative. Do you yeah. think that this might be the trajectory that your career would follow in terms of, I'll say, revolutionary art <laughs> or this, you know, do the right thing feel? Sure, or is yeah. this just the tip of the iceberg of what you're hoping to offer? I don't know yet. You know, that's the thing about it. It's like, it's hard to say. I mean, I know that I, you know, I, I, I would love to someone to tell me after three films mm -hmm. what kind of filmmaker I am because mm -hmm. I really just, I'm, I'm interested in so many things. I love, but I will say, I love movies that leave you feeling some type of way. I yeah. love movies that, you know, whatever genre they're in, whether it's like for the mainstream or it's art house, movies were like, when you leave that theater, like you cannot just go home. Like you can't like go get a burger and get some drinks. Like you have to like have a minute yeah. and like have a conversation about what yeah. you just saw. Like yeah. those are the movies that were impactful to me as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I just really can't get it up for a story that doesn't do that. I just can't. So, you know, whether or not my next movie is, you know, a science fiction epic or it's, you know, a tiny little movie about, you know, I don't know, some neighborhood. I don't know. Yeah. Like, it, it has to leave, it has to have the intention of leaving an audience feeling some kind of way and, yeah. and somehow holding the mirror up and saying something about our life and our times. Yeah. So this is going to be a two-part. Um, in your own words, what would you say the film is about? Okay. And then the follow-up to that is how did you get people behind it and get it made? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, at the core of it, my movie is a, it's a movie about identity. It's about I, the conflict between identity and self and how, you know, depending on how that battle is won, that, that limits or expands your potential. Mm -hmm. And I t I'm talking about that through a black lens and through the language of race politics and, and race toggling that sort of, you know, is kind of on the minds of, of people in my generation. But ultimately, I am speaking to something that is a universal aspect of the human condition, you know, not to get too highfalutin, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, the great, great art, no matter what the point of view, no matter what the lens is always speaking to something that's mm -hmm. truthful for everybody. And, and that's what I wanted to do with this film. And I, and I knew that, you know, dear, it's called Dear White People. Obviously, it deals with the experience of, you know, being a black face in a white place and all that. But once you get past the race politics, like, I wanted it to be a story about identity and self and finding ourselves. Yeah. And do you feel like that universality is what helped it get made and helped get people behind it? I think so, because, you know, we had people, because before this was ever a thing, it was just a concept trailer. It was, you know, what if this was a real movie trailer? And people watched it. It was like, when is this coming out? And right. the end was like, it's not, unless you give us some money <laughs> and follow right. us on Facebook. Right. And so, you know, people did that. But, like, you know, what we were able to find through that is, like, some people showed up, 
because that was their experience and finally a movie was articulating what they were always talking about and going through. And some people showed up because they were like, yeah, where did these movies go? Mm -hmm. Like, where did movies that like, you know, in a funny sort of in your face, tongue in cheek way deal with like interesting new points of views? Like, why is everything like got to be in its little genre lane? You know, where did the conversation idea movies go? And those people aren't necessarily black. They aren't necessarily in college. They aren't necessarily in the age demographic. Those people were just fans of cinema like I am and you know just miss that kind of movie so you know that's always really been our fan base and as we've been able to screen the movie at festivals like that's who shows up you know there's some people who are like this is me all day every day yeah and some people are like this is not me but I am fascinated by this Absolutely. let's do it <laughs> I, th I think the concept the idea and even like the the packaging and the delivery is very um eye-catching and it, it just catches you I mean I've been yeah. it's been on my radar for a while something I've been really excited about um, and the first way I found out about it was through social media cool. so can you talk a little bit about how social media you like really using technology to your advantage yeah. nowadays as a filmmaker um, what role did social media and and online presence play in the success and, and the virility of of the film yeah, I mean, for me, it was, you know, it was just sort of like the only step I could take sometimes, you know, it was for, you know, the Twitter account, Dear White People really started for me as a writer's tool. It was like, how do I sort of like test out Sam White's jokes? Samantha White is the character in the film that has the radio show, Dear White People, where she is, you know, sort of taking white people to task for microaggressions. And I just needed a way to talk her out, you know, I, she, all of the characters are aspects of my personality, but that one in particular, like the quips, you know, I needed, I just, as a writer, I needed work on that. Dear White People. The minimum requirement of black friends needed to not seem racist has just been raised to two. Sorry, but your weed man, Tyrone, does not count. Dear white people, please stop touching my hair. Does this look like a petting zoo to you? Mistress in, dating a black person to piss off your parents is a form of racism. I use a Twitter account to test out her jokes and to test out her voice and to also get, um, you know, dissenting opinions that I wanted to encourage, I wanted to put in the movie because, you know, the thing, the joy about a multi-protagonist story is you get everybody's opinions in there and you never say which one is good, which one is bad. Uh, you just sort of put them all in there and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that was like, that that was a tool to, to do that. And when it came down to, you know, the screenplay being ready to get out there, Nobody was checking for this. Like, <laughs> movies don't get made in Hollywood unless a movie like it made money last year. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, making a concept trailer, putting it on YouTube, having an Indiegogo camp, that's the only thing we could do. You know what I mean? So that's what we did. And yeah. because we couldn't go through the gate, we yeah. just kind of went around it. And yeah. the internet provided a way to go around it, to build up an audience. You know, by the time the movie got financed, we had this audience. And the, there was no movie. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of kept, I found myself just saying that in meetings, like, people are showing up and there's not a movie yet. Imagine what they'll do when there's a movie. Yeah. You yeah. should let us yeah. make this movie, <laughs> yeah. right, you know. Right. Uh, and eventually, like, Code Red Films took a chance and financed the whole thing and got us done by Sundance. The tip test. You hit up jellies for a snack. Your waitress mistakes you for someone who looks like you. Black, who once ran up a $30 bill and left a dollar tip. You watch all the other customers order before you do. Pastrami sandwich on rye. And then proceed to wait no less than 40 minutes for your food. How do you tip? What would you say distinguishes uh, filmmakers of today, mm. uh, black filmmakers of today from black filmmakers of previous generations? I think that, you know, now things is, there has been a total democratization. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to put your opinion out there, is, it's just never been quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, between black Twitter, which everybody's sort of like, you know, <laughs> talking about now, um, to stuff like, you know, Awkward Black Girl being this huge presence on YouTube. Like, we have the tools to sort of get our, our voices out there. Now, that also is a double-edged sword because there's so many people talking, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to make an impact. But at least it's possible, you know, before you, you really, you know, it, it's very, very difficult to get a movie made. And in, in the climate of Hollywood today, it's incredibly difficult to get a movie made in or out of the studio system with people of color. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's so many ways to sort of get your voice out there that has nothing to do with the gatekeepers and the traditional models. Yeah. So yeah. in some ways it's harder, in some ways it's better. So this movie, you know, is is aiming near 
the mainstream, you know what I yeah. mean? And we're yeah. trying to sort of like introduce a conversation there and, and hopefully a lane there mm -hmm. for the other filmmakers and, and, and just sort of being in this industry and having the friends that I have, like I've read so many scripts that are like, oh my God, this has to get made. So we got, we need one to come first and make some money. So right. they'll with this because <laughs> right. that is genius. Right, right, you know right, what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's why as extras, the uh, important to support opening weekend. That's right. Um, so there is a Dear White People book. Uh, the last two questions or yeah. the half are, <laughs> yeah, should I hold up want, the book? Yeah, I want you to hold up the book. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about um, the, you know, how it pertains to the film and what you want people to take collectively from the Dear White People movement. Yeah, so um, you know, the book is sort of kind of in tongue in cheek, you know, uh, satirical, uh, you know, tradition of the film. It's just kind of tackling the idea of sort of surviving, in, you know, in these interracial communities in post-racial America. Mm -hmm. And I'm just riffing off of a lot of the topics in the film, more of an in a, in a kind of essay way, but it's also really interactive. You can take these personality quizzes to say, to figure out you know how black you are. Again, this is tongue in cheek, so nobody <laughs> takes you know, this is not a textbook, okay? Uh, <laughs> but really, to mock the idea of being you know authentically black and right. and 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 things that, you know things other things in the book is like when is it okay to, to wear blackface? Of course, mm -hmm. the answer is always never. Always but never. you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just sort of it's just sort of in its own satirical mocking way, taking to task all the ideas that the movie takes to task. Um, and it's just a fun way to keep the brand alive because I do believe that these characters and the world of the story and the things that I'm saying really just begin with the film. You know, it's my in my it's my heart of hearts. This this project belongs on television. I mm -hmm. feel like TV is like kind of caught up in terms of the aesthetic and in terms of you know unique storytelling and embracing new voices. That I would love to take these characters to the small screen and like you know give me 13 hours to really yeah. get really get into it. Really flesh as it opposed out, yeah. to you know two. So yeah. we'll That's see what fun. happens. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Thank you Dustin, so much. I appreciate for it. For taking the time to talk with us. Pleasure. Fabulous film. Um, pleasure. Everybody should go check it out. Hey. 40 minutes? She's lucky if she gets 40 cents. Okay, you do a good job, maybe see a tip. B? <laughs> she was tripping, but 15% is the least I can do. Or C? I reject the stereotype that African Americans do not tip. I will leave 20, no, 25, just to prove that I can. One hundred oofta nose job. <laughs>